Hey, good morning, Renew Bible. Thank you for being here today on this gorgeous Sunday. It's really nice out, and if you're watching us online, we'd love to have you, and we're glad you're here as well as we continue in our Mark series. Now, I don't know about you, but throughout the summer, you go a lot of places that you're not necessarily familiar with, and, uh, and sometimes you can arrive on places and kind of get upset if, if, if things aren't what you were kind of anticipating based on what you saw, and there's never more true when it comes to hours of operation. Is there nothing more discouraging than pulling up to some place you were so excited to go to and looking and seeing closed? Now, how many of you are like me sometimes and you still check the door? I mean, I mean, there, there, there's nobody there. The lights are out, okay? There's no movement. And you're like, I don't get it. And you look in, I remember I worked retail out of high school and college and, and I remember how um, dumbfounded I was by how many people would try the door when we are clearly closed and the signs up closed. Oh, it, it's terrible. And you know what's even worse? You know what's even worse? When you're going towards the store and you see them and they're walking up and you're like, no, 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 and you watch them and there's almost like they slightly like it, don't they? Don't, don't, they, don't, have you ever done it? Like, oh, there you go. <laughs> ah, no, no. I've had that experience multiple times, including walking up to Johnson's popcorn on the boardwalk and being so sad that it wasn't open. But you know what? Any young parents in the room, you know what's even worse? When you got a little toddler who's looking forward to something. And you are all hyped up about it. You've been even pulling the fake parent lines, like, if you don't start behaving, we're not going. But you want it just as bad as they do, so you're going. And you get there, and you pull up, and you're all excited, and, 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 and you've been talking about this, and you look, and you go, no, no way. What? Is it Monday? What? what? What's going on? I mean, if you went after church to Chick-fil-A, you get this experience today. I mean, they're like, oh, no, no. What? happened to me pulled up with one of our little kids and and they were just little in the back and and I said I'm so sorry it's closed and you know what they said well daddy open it <laughs> now now you might laugh but in my family especially when they were little they tended to believe dad had supernatural powers now, why? Because dad was a liar, that's why. And, and um, there were times we'd be in rainstorms driving down highways, and just as we get to the overpass, I, I'd become the Messiah, okay? Now, now please keep the context here. But I, I'd be driving along, it's raining. And you ever go under an overpass and right? So I would leverage that. As we get to the underpass, I'd yell, peace, be still. Okay, it can rain. <laughs> and our little ones would be like, do it again. Do it again, daddy. Well, I can't just do it any time. Come on, Lord, give me another overpass. Give me another one. <laughs> I had been known to walk up to automated doors and say, be opened. And they would open. I'd be like, huh? Huh? What? Now, as you have older kids, you can't do it to the younger ones because the older kids like, grow up, dad, grow up. But I remember hearing from the back, daddy, open it. I said, but I can't open it. I remember toddlers at times going, dad, I want to buy that. Well, we don't have the money for that. Go to the machine. <laughs> I can't open that. But, but, you know, it's one thing when we see something closed that we desire to be open when it comes to a store. But what about when it comes to, when it comes to a, a mindset? You know, there's a difference, they say, between a closed mindset and an opened mindset. Do you know which way you lean? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, well, let me give you a couple characteristics of a closed mindset 
versus an open mindset. This is not, this is not my research. I just gathered it from a multiple different places and put it all together and uh, kind of came up with a lot of these summaries as well as grabbed this from a few places. But let's just, let's just review this, okay? It's not scripture, so we can argue with it. But, but uh, let's look at here. Closed-minded people make statements. Open-minded people ask questions. Closed-minded people, like, this is what's going on with that. Open-minded people go, I wonder what's going on with that. Okay, okay. Closed-minded people want to speak. Open-minded people want to listen. Okay. Um, Closed-minded people want to be understood. Open-minded people want to understand. This is what I want you to understand about what I'm doing. Open-minded people say, help me understand why you're doing that. Closed-minded people feel they're right. Open-minded people fear they might be wrong. Closed-minded people, watch this, get angry. Open-minded people, they get interested. I need to look into this more. Whereas a closed-minded person, surprisingly, they, they get angry about things. Which would you say you tend towards an area of mindset? And you might be there going, depends. Depends the subject. In a room this size, with as many children of God gathered here, there's a lot of faith in this room. There may be a lot of children of God gathered with us online as well. But I bet if I were to walk up to each one of you and said, do you have someone in your family, relatives, or someone very dear to you who is close-minded to the things of God? that the answer for almost everyone in this room would be yes. Like, like if, if, if there's a, a, a verse of script, no, they don't want to hear it. Things of the Bible, they don't want to hear it. They're closed off. And don't you just want to yell, daddy, open it. Open it. Be opened. You're not even giving the word of God a chance. You've completely tuned it out. It's as if you've hit the mute button when the things of God are right in front of you. What happened? How could they not see? How could they, having ears, they have ears, I'm looking at them, they have ears, yet they don't hear. How is this possible? And your cry is, Lord, I just want them to be open. But you found out something, didn't you? You can't control whether that happens. You can't make it happen. You might send a card every single day. You might have a link and say, watch Chris's last message. But it doesn't mean anything. Why? Why is that? Today, I want to talk about not only why that is, but the only one who can actually take things that were closed and say, be opened. Our text is the gospel of Mark. It's chapter seven, verses 31 through 37. I'm going to have a word of prayer and we're going to look into this text immediately. Heavenly Father, Use your word today to penetrate hearts. Lord, our prayer partners this morning have specifically been praying for each audience that come in here today that they would receive this in humility for what we are to hear today will hit home in so many different ways. For we all know people and we all have areas in our life where we have closed you off God and we need to reopen or be opened and so Lord I pray that you would use this message so if you would Lord clear the room of distractions if you would Lord prepare the hearts to be receptive of this message and if you would Lord may we leave different because we visited this place today and sat under your word and so Lord with reverence we open up your sacred text to study the book of Mark again. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, 
Amen. Well, then he returned. Who? Jesus, from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you're listening on podcast, you can't necessarily see the map I have, but if you're here in the room today, which you all are, you can see this map behind me, and I want you to read the verse again and look at the map geography and, and ask yourself a question. What is he doing? Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, there's Tyre, there's where he was with the Seraphonician woman, and he's coming to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so let's look at the map here. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon. Where are you, where, what, where are you going? Did he put in the wrong coordinates on his GPS? What? Jesus, what are you doing here? You would have never picked that up if you had just read that. But when you study scripture with the depth to realize the geography of it as well, oh my word, something comes up. Well, Jesus, what were you doing? It's like you went on a circle. He, if he went from Tyre and he went to the Sea of Galilee, if he went through Sidon, he did like a circle because we know he went up this way. He came around here and I know this is predominantly Gentile terrier. Oh, it's Gentile terrier. What? Jesus must have someone to talk to, something to do, somewhere to go, because none of his movements were by mistake. But many commentators are still dumbfounded as why Jesus took such a long route. Nonetheless, he did. And the context today is given even more depth by comparing it to another passage in Matthew, which he records not to the detail of Mark about what was going on. Matthew says this, Jesus went on from there and he walked beside the Sea of Galilee and he went up on a mountain and sat down at the mountain and watch what happened. And, and as usual, great crowds came to him bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. The mute, someone who can't speak or if they do speak with a speech impairment. That's all Matthew says. And no other gospel writer says anything more about the mute man at all, except for Mark. Which is interesting because we know Mark wasn't necessarily an eyewitness, yet he records this with the detail, which furthermore, if you've been with us in our series, seems to demonstrate that it was probably Peter who was giving Mark the information he was recording. And Mark goes into detail about how Jesus worked with the mute man. And wow, is it interesting. Let's read it together. And they brought him, Mark says, they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Scripture continues and says, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And then, and then Jesus looked to heaven, he sighed and said to him, now, 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 now wait a minute, before we go any further, time out, time out. Took him aside? Took him aside. Now, now, I don't know about you, but I, I've been in leadership long enough to know that if I ever take somebody aside, a couple things are going on. One, they need to be addressed, and if they were to be addressed publicly, it could possibly embarrass them, so you take them aside. Two, you can't seem to get their attention, no matter what you do, and so you take them aside. Some teachers are getting ready for the fall to begin even this week. I bet sometime this school year, you will take someone aside. But there's also another reason to take someone aside, and that is because you want their undivided attention with what you're about to say or do to them. And Jesus, not speaking to him per se because he can't hear, he takes him aside. I wonder if he motioned, took him, Moved him away. Now, now they're on a mountain, Matthew told me, so they didn't go into another room. So that means the crowd saw them going over either by a tree or whatever. And so we have hundreds in this room, but, but Matthew kind of indicates that there were thousands still kind of coming at him and they're all kind of watching Jesus take him aside. 
What's he doing? Jesus gets out of where everybody sees him and he's got him on the side. And scripture tells me he puts his fingers in his ears. Kids, if you're here today and parents feel free to play along too, as well as grandparents. If you've ever done, have you ever done this? Have you ever done? Just listen to how I sound when you do this. Go ahead, feel free, feel free. If you ever do that, I would be really sad if you listened to the whole message like that. That would really communicate to me. But for the, say, it sounds kind of numb, right? So you could barely hear, it's kind of echoing. Jesus walks up now and he takes his fingers. Kids, you ever go to the doctor and you get their physical and they put that thing in your ear and you're like, oh, that's so weird, right? You feel it? He does it with his fingers and he, he sticks his fingers in his, well, that's so that he can hear. Time out, time out, time out. Last week, I watched Jesus ignoring a woman begging for crumbs. And she says, even the dogs get crumbs. And he says, go home, your daughter's healed. So I know something, he don't need to do this. He doesn't need to do this. So why is he doing this? What's going on here? Jesus is over here on the side and he's putting on a little bit of an illustration and the crowds are watching. It's just here, hey, 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 right there, touches his ears and then he spits. Now, I don't know about you, but moms, if you took your kids to the pediatrics this week and they went, hold on, I know, um, you had that time out. We're not gonna be doing that, right? G Jesus doesn't necessarily care about that. He's doing this because spittle was known to have a medicinal aspect to it. So Jesus is now kind of working with the culture here a little bit. I think he wants everyone to know that the only way this is about to happen is because of him. Touches his ears, spits, touches his tongue. And then scripture says this, he looks and sighs and said to him, Ephatha! And you're all like, oh yeah, I say that all the time. Ephatha. Which means, anybody want to guess? Be opened. And scripture says this, his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Now, now I have some people that are very dear to me in my life who have uh, hearing impairments. And I'm not just talking about my elderly father, okay? But people who have actual impairments and their speech can be slurred at times or elongated, okay? Because they don't necessarily hear what they're hearing. Good, good brothers and sisters in Christ that, that have this. And you know what it sounds like. And there's a pause in what they're saying and it's gone. There's a pause and then it's gone. It's completely gone. And the people are like, what? And not only on top of that, he hears and he speaks plainly. It's not just he started to speak better, speaking plainly. And then scripture says this, he says this, and Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They're praising God. I mean, Jesus is amazing at opening things. He needs to work on his ability to close things. Obviously, there is a reason behind that that we'll discover as we continue in our series through Mark, even into the fall. But they're praising God. They're proclaiming it. And they're astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. It harkens back to Genesis with, behold, it was good. Jesus does all things well and they're astonished beyond measure. And, and that word that gets translated astonished beyond measure carries the idea of dumbfounded, shocked. They can't believe it. I mean, it's unbelievable that he can cast out demons. It's unbelievable that he can heal the woman's daughter. It's unbelievable that he could hear, heal Jairus' daughter. It's unbelievable that he can feed the 5,000, but, but he even makes those people who can't hear and can't speak able to by the word vata. He even makes the deaf and the mute speak. It's astonishing. But you know what caught my eye? A little phrase that made me even go, 
Why did he do that? Because when I, I, I love to ask questions of the scripture when I read it. I love to put myself in the situation the best I can. But there was something that jumped out, and maybe you heard it too, and you're like, wait, wait, why did he, why did he do that? I, I, I saw him touching the ears. I saw the spit. I guess he was putting on a demonstration to say, this can only be me. But I noticed something. I noticed this. I noticed that I read that he sighed. Why did he sigh? Well, I mean... I read one commentary said because this this miracle might have been really difficult. I'm like, what? All of them are difficult. Lazarus was pretty difficult, right? There was no sigh there. What? One commented, is it possible because upon investigating his ears and his tongue, he realized it was demonic in nature? Possibly, possibly. But you know the best way to decipher what scripture is trying to say or elude to is not by typing in Google and getting eight commentaries or five thoughts from people who might believe in the scriptures or who might not. That's not the way. The best and first hermeneutic, that is a way, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but the best hermeneutic, the best way to study scripture and see its context is to compare it with other opinions other scripture. So I got thinking, is there anywhere else in scripture where Jesus sighed? Because I know what I'm thinking when I sigh. <sighs> I can think a lot of things, but one might be, um, I guess the Phillies aren't gonna score this whole game. <sighs> can mean, oh, are you kidding me? They're closed. <sighs> could simply mean if you're a little more advanced in years, I guess I have to get up now. Here we go. <laughs> we sigh for many different reasons. Why did Jesus sigh? Well, where else did he sigh in scripture? Well, well, he sighed in scripture in Mark 8, 12. And we know Mark to be one who points out Jesus' emotions. And so I'm gonna do something you don't usually do with an audience. I'm gonna read multiple verses in a row. They say that public audiences can only handle so many verses in a row before they get, begin to check out. But Renew Bible tracks a little smarter than the rest of the audiences. And, and, and so I'm gonna read this because we're good listeners here. And, and, and watch this. It's often referred to as the feeding of the 4,000 and then the Pharisees demanding a sign. Listen to Jesus in context of why he sighed. Okay, let's draw some conclusions. In those days when a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and he said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. In the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, they're still here. We have no food for them. Here, Jesus goes, they're still here. We got no food, guys. What's he doing? And the disciples answered him, how can, we, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? How could we possibly feed this many people with the bread we have? Guys, what? What? I don't know. How, how are we going to feed all these people? What? What, you all were there at the feeding of the 5,000 guys? What? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. That's better than five and two, but here we go. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd and they had a few small fish and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them and they ate and were satisfied and they took up broken pieces left over, seven baskets this time. And there were about 4,000 people and he sent them away and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalamutha and there the Pharisees come up and they began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven. Do something to show your God. Are you kidding me? He has fed 5,000 people. He has fed 4,000 people. 
He's walked on water. He's done all these different things. And the disciples are like, I'm not sure what he's gonna do. I mean, here we are in a desert place. But I got thinking, how many times in my life am I going through something right now and I'm wondering if God will provide when I can go back one month and see that he will? The Pharisees walk up, we need some sort of sign. They're not catching this. And Jesus, scripture says, sighed deeply in his spirit. They got ears. They've got physical ears, but they don't hear. They got eyes, they don't see. They do not see he's God. He's showing them he's God and they're not getting it. People who should be open because he's standing in front of them are completely closed. And Jesus sighs. Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them and he got in the boat and went to the other side. And in the boat, how many of you have read this? This is unbelievable. In the boat, watch what happens. Just after he fed him, okay. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of, the bre- of Herod. He, he sees they have one loaf, that's all they got. And he says, watch out, beware of the leaven. Now, now kids, we talk about unleavened bread sometimes at church and that's that flat bread. Well, the Jews would have understood unleavened bread to be, to be more of a, a symbolically good and leavened bread is when it gets thick and yummy, right? But leavened bread has yeast in it and they were to get that out in their culture as a symbol of getting the sin out and using that unleavened bread. So Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So he's saying, beware of their hypocrisy. Beware, they have filthiness in them. Beware, they have all sorts of rampant wickedness. Beware, they have strife. And where there is strife, there is pride. Beware, they have leaven in them. And the disciples hearing Jesus say this about leaven, here's what they do. Right after the feeding of the 4,000, they began discussing with the fact that they have no bread. Peter, do you have the bread? I, 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 thought, I thought Philip was bringing the bread. Philip, did you bring the bread? I thought Nathaniel was bringing the bread. We got no bread. Great, we got no bread. And Jesus is sitting there going, you have got to be kidding me. And Jesus, aware of this, said, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Who's asking the questions now? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Twelve. And the seven for the 4,000, how many full baskets did you take up? Seven. And he asked them, do you not understand? I mean, have you completely tuned this out? The Pharisees have, but guys, are you not hearing what I'm saying? Are you not seeing what I'm doing? Parents of teenagers or even college students, have you ever been talking to them in the back and they're not responding? And you're like, what's up with that? And you turn and you look and they've got earbuds in. Oh, okay. Well, that's getting a little upset that they weren't listening. Our daughter walked up to us recently and said, look, 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 this is a, this is a tape. Like they had tapes and, and look, I decorated. You can, you can really make these a craft project. And, and, And my wife and I were kind of offended that she thought she could teach us about tapes. Cassette tapes, like a child of 80s, we were both. No, 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 you sit down, you don't understand. We understand about cassette tapes. See, because I remember, I remember when these things started coming out. Let me teach a little bit about headphones getting plugged in to what we like to call, listen to me, Walkman. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Sometimes our Walkmans got so advanced, we would put CDs in them and have anti-skip functions. <laughs> you could be running and it would pause, wait, wait, there it is, we're back. 
And we would attach these and we could take our music wherever we want. I know you can drive a boardwalk now and people got all their, their different beats pills and all these different stuff to listen to. But, but we had these headphones and we put them on and we could turn the world off and focus on just what we wanted. And with cassette tapes, we could even record our favorite songs off the radio. And so when the radio was playing, we would hit record on our cassette tape and record it off the radio so we could hear it again. We could hear it multiple times. The only thing is you had to make sure mom didn't call for dinner during the cassette recording. Hey, everyone be quiet down there. You didn't want your band on like the best third song, like, are you coming for dinner? Just ignore that. Your buddies are like, was that your mom? Don't, don't. Let's record in my room. But we had these things and we record and we had this technology and we couldn't believe that we could walk around with it and tune the world out and just listen to what we want to listen to. Ah. Jesus seems to sigh in scripture when he's around people who were closed that should be opened. When he's around people who are closed, that should be open. They should be seeing this. Now, now some of you enjoy when we take one more dive down into the scriptures and I say things like, hey, let's go to seminary for just a second. So, so listen to me here for just a second. There is a word in this text that shows that Jesus is doing far more than just healing somebody on the side. Scripture said this, you might remember this verse. It said, there was a man was deaf and had a speech impediment. The Greek word is magalalos. Magalalos, what is magalalos? It's a, it's a very rare Greek word and it's only used here and one other time. And the other time it's used is actually in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of both the Old Testament and the New. For those of you who understand a little bit about textual criticism, you know that we get our translations in the Old Testament from Hebrew and the New Testament from Greek. But the Septuagint gives us both, and the Septuagint has that word, magilalos, in this place and one other. It's found in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, where Isaiah is speaking about and predicting Messiah would do things when he comes. And Isaiah said this, then the lame man will leap like a deer and the tongue of the magalalos will speak. Jesus is showing himself and he's being met with people who are just not getting it. The disciples, because of their lack of understanding, the Pharisees, because they've tuned him out. And it's as if Jesus is saying, why don't you understand? Why aren't you taking note of this? Here's something I took note of. I enjoyed this quote. Defective speech usually results from defective hearing. We all know that. Both physically and spiritually. When you hear someone speaking and it's not the things of God, there is a good chance that that is not a person who is listening to the things of God. And it's as if he's saying, if you have ears to hear, hear this. And it made me think of another place in scripture where I'm told to take note. And I want you to see some parallels. It's in James chapter one. And he says this, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Take note of that. Write that down. Record that. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So, so, so let's get a little more of the context here. Here, Everyone should be quick to listen. The idea here is, hey, hey, who, wait, 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 everybody, quiet, 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 quiet. What did they just say? What did they just say? Hey, can you replay that? Can you replay that? Okay, go, go. That's how we are to receive what Jesus is saying here, or James is saying, excuse me. Slow to speak. Oh, I know what that is. I can tell you what that is. I don't even need to hear this. I don't even need to hear this. I'll tell you what that's. No, no, no. Shh. 
and then slow to become angry. Now, I look at that and, and I go, slow to become angry? That doesn't seem like a natural progression, does it? I, I get the, okay, so quick to listen. I, I need to become a better listener. I need to be a little more open. Okay, I get that. Um, slow to speak, so maybe ask more questions instead of voicing only my opinion. I get all that, but what about anger? Why, why was the progression to angry? Is it possible when we don't wanna hear something that we don't agree with or we don't like or that we've experienced that hasn't played out well for us that we grow towards anger? And then James says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger does not produce righteousness. Have you ever fallen trapped thinking that anger would produce righteousness? You idiot, how could you not do that? It doesn't really produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Anger doesn't do that. Self-righteousness will tend to think if I yell enough, demean enough, use enough harsh words, get angry enough, they'll change. But that doesn't produce the righteousness of God. That will not make someone more open to the truth. It will make someone more closed, it seems. Have you ever fallen prey to anger? Anger's a scary thing. And we've been noting as a church leadership more and more situations where we've seen outbursts of anger. And we were even noting amongst ourselves, if you're willing to have an outburst publicly where we often try to put on our best self, what's it like in the home? If we're willing to flip out and scream and yell, even as children of God, publicly, what's it like in the home? Whenever I talk about anger, I refer to it as the -the jack-in-the-box dynamic. And unfortunately, in a crowd this size, there may be even someone in here who lives with a jack-in-the-box but there may also be someone who is the jack in the box. Could you please be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to become angry because I wanna talk about this for just a minute because if it's happening in public, I can't imagine what it's like behind closed doors. You know the jack in the box, the sweet little song, right? Ooh, He came early on me. There it is. Mom's making dinner, right? Your father's almost home. Did that professor just say that? Did that person just pull in front of me? And then, you know, I watched a toddler. And the toddler went, and then went, it was great. Unless you live with one. And then everyone in the house is on pins and needles. Everyone on the house is nervous because they're living amongst the jack in the box. And human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. But I want to teach a little something about this and stay with me. People who have angry outbursts often find themselves within hours, sometimes minutes, incredibly sad at what they did. 
Because they also know that anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And they saw what they did and they saw that family member's face or they thought about that whole conversation. We went out to breakfast with our best friends and we chose to use it as a vent session. Oh, what did I do? I wish I could go back. I gotta, I gotta stop voicing this or I exploded or I saw that. Because dad, if you're slamming the steering wheel, the eight year old will when he's 25 too, and you know it. And ma, when you're kicking something across the kitchen, you know the five year old probably will too. And it eats at you and you're like, I gotta stop. This has got to stop. Because a lot of jack in the boxes after their explosions and they get that emotional stress out, they sit there and they go, I can't keep doing this because where? This occurs, broken relationships are everywhere. And at the root of anger, I had a brother in Christ go, Chris, you know what is at the root of anger? I said, well, what do you got? What do you got? One word. It was great. I said, what? He goes, here it is, pain. They're in pain. They've either lost something that they didn't want to lose and they have emotional, but there's also physical pain people are in that brings anger. And so there's emotional pain, there's physical pain, there's something that reminds them of something that engages them and they have all this anger and it comes pouring out. And so listen to me, we, churches often don't go into this area, so I'm taking a big risk, don't, don't, don't shoot the messenger. Where there is anger, scripture says, where there is strife, conflict, anger, upsetness, there's pride. But, but, watch this. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. You know how many viciously angry 17, 18, 19 year old guys are? And thank goodness they have football on Friday nights. Do you know how many viciously angry teenagers, college students, senior saints, Moms and dads, businessmen, businesswomen. And they've got this anger and there's strife in their life. And at the root of it, scripture tells me there's pride, but there's wisdom in those who take advice. Can I give you a quick five things you might wanna think about when it comes to anger? Because maybe, maybe you know someone with anger, but maybe this week you're gonna be tempted with it and God wanted you here today. Scripture says this, note this. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. You need to ask yourself, what provokes me? Self-awareness comes when we begin to ask questions of ourselves. If you've never asked this question, ask this one today. What is it like to live with me? What is it like to live with me? What provokes me? Here's why it's important. The enemy hides the way he's trying to tempt you. He doesn't always show the bait. It's often a cute little song. Because he wants boom. Because guess what? Parents, you've learned this with teenagers maybe the hard way. You get one or two crazy explosions and then guess what happens? They're closed. No, 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 they should be open, I'm the parent. And they're closed. You get one or two. You get to make her ball one or two times and then it starts to close. And the enemy knows that and he wants your voice to be gone. You get a few times, maybe at work, maybe one time, the world's a little less gracious and then people start closing off to you. And the enemy wants to provoke you so you explode and he's going, do, 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 do. be open, be open. <laughs> Don't let him win. Don't let him win, Jack. Don't let him win, Jackie. Don't let him win. Here's a second one. 
Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. I want you to ask yourself, Jack, ask yourself, Jackie, how am I displaying folly? Whatever you're demonstrating, oh, this stupid idiot is being watched. But it's also impacting others. And that display is being modeled. Think about that before you're open. Scripture says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Oh, the devil's so sneaky. If he can get you all listening to news and podcasts that's full of harsh words and fighting and conflict because it's great clickbait. He can get you all worked up because he knows one of the ways to provoke you is to get you constantly hearing harsh words. And so if you're listening to this stuff all day long, there's harshness in your life. And what does harsh words do? They stir up anger. And you're like, I don't even know why I'm so mad all the time. What are you listening to if you have harsh words in your life? It's just a simple news station. But when I pour it into you, pop, goes Jack or Jackie, and division goes across your family. He's sneaky, isn't he? Isn't he sneaky? Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Who do I give my full vents to? Is it my husband? Is it my wife? Ladies, if the devil wants to discourage your husband, you're telling me, you're telling me he might use you? He's late for dinner again. For God is hearing aids, you better let him know. Pop! Goes to marriage. (laughs) Sneaky, isn't he? Don't let him win. Church, don't let him win. Discouraged brother or sister who is struggling with rage, don't let him win. Scripture says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Why should you get rid of it? Because it's destroying you. You might say, well, what about righteous anger? I mean, there's a time, I mean, I feel like I'm right about what I'm mad at. You see what I'm looking at? And I love this quote. It keeps me humble on the moments where I do feel righteous anger because I feel it just like you. This one keeps me humble, it says this. A person who is angry on the right grounds against the right persons in the right manner at the right moment and for the right length of time deserves a great deal of praise. In other words, it's not typical that we're angry but we do not sin, as scripture says. Therefore, don't let harbored anger go. But instead, put away all leaven, I mean, filthiness. Put away all leaven, I mean wickedness. Put away all leaven and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me the context of being slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to become angry, is how I'm receiving, not people. Have you ever heard that passage leveraged on listen to people, listen to people, there's nothing wrong with that. But the actual context of James is this. I'll illustrate it for you visibly. Wait, wait, before you start, what's that, Holy Spirit, what? I want you, as you open this, to be, ready? Quick to hear it. What's it say, what's it say, what's it say? Slow to speak, I bet. If I could do this, then that, ver- slow. I find it hard to believe. Slow, slow, quick to hear, slow to speak. Let the Holy Spirit do its work and slow to become, I can't even believe this is, this is not, this wouldn't be socially acceptable now what the Bible's saying right here. Slow to become angry. Let it sink in. Jesus, James, is saying to all those that are close to the scripture, there's stuff in here that can help you with that anger. It can help. No, it can't. It's archaic. It's it's for other people. It can help you with that anger. Don't be closed to the implanted word. 
Don't make statements. Don't want to speak. Don't want to be understood. Try to understand it. Don't feel you're right. Fear you might be wrong. Don't get angry. Get interested. For God shows his love towards every Jack and every Jackie in the word of God. This week, I want you to be a good listener. I want you to be opened. Do you know if you're a good listener? Do you know if that applies not only to people but to scripture? I love listening tests, but I wanted to apply it a different way. Three ways specifically as we leave and face whatever challenge might come our way today. Maybe even in the parking lot on the way out. Do you enjoy listening to people? Listening tests often will ask. If the answer is no, you're probably not a good listener. Another question is, do you listen to people even if you do not like what they're saying? If the answer is no, you're probably not a good listener and you're closed off. And that might be one thing. But what about with scripture? Let me rephrase. What's your attitude? Do you enjoy listening to the word of God? No. No, actually, I don't. Have you ever considered praying about that? Lord, may you want me I know you want me to, Lord, would you make me want to listen to your word? Because the enemy right now might have a lot of harsh words and a lot of harsh things going on in your car or in your earphones or young people, whatever you're listening to. And it's his trick to fill you with rage and wreck everyone around you. Don't let him win. Do you listen to the word even if you don't like what it's saying? How about your actions? They say every good listener, they don't decide their response before they finish the other person hearing. Go ahead, speak, and then I'll come up with my response. Do you tend to go, I got a response for that while they're talking? It's not a sign of a good listener. Another question is, do you interrupt what you're doing and nod, respond, or ask questions? Are you a verbal, nonverbal listener? Let me ask the same question about your actions. Do you decide your response before you finish hearing what the word of God is saying? Or do you open that going, I'm going to conclude what I hear when I read this? Do you interrupt what you're doing so you can note take, ask questions, and respond to the word of God? Or is the Bible something you read or listen to with lots of distractions? Don't let the enemy in. Let Jesus pull you aside and say, I want to share something with just you. A good listener also, there's a third area, attention. Do you let the other person finish as you think about what the person really is trying to say? Do you restate what is said for better understanding? You see, attentiveness is a big key to being a good listener. Let me ask you this. Do you study the word so you can really understand what it's saying? Don't just depend on Chris or one of the pastors here. Do you have opportunities in your life to study it? Do you memorize what the word of God says? Not only for better understanding, but to hide it in your heart so that you might not sin against him. You see, the truth of scripture is, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry in context is how we receive the word of God. Not only when we're a good listener are people more open to us, the word of God is as well. If you're a Jack in the box or a Jackie in the box, my goal was not to attack you today. I don't think there's a person in this room who has not had an anger outburst. But my encouragement to you, what's provoking you? Who do you need to go apologize to? Who do you need to stop putting your full vent on? Because the enemy's using it to close people around you and isolate you into discouragement. Don't let him win. The devil's saying be open, but there's some things in our lives where we need to let the word of God say, I need to stop that and take that challenge. There might even be somebody that you wanna walk up to and say, hey, forgive me last time I did that. 
But in a room this size, I began with asking, do any of you have someone who is close to the things of God that you so wish would be open? Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you that Jesus is the only one who can open them. And the exact same Jesus, get this, the exact same God that took that man aside in front of a thousand some people, that same God who goes, be opened, can do that to this day. And although we can't, oh, and we'd love to, he can. So child of God, let that beautiful thought resonate with you today and throughout this week that you might not be able to open them. And rage is certainly not gonna open them. Scolding them is never gonna open them. Sending them every link and going, you needed to hear this isn't gonna open them. But getting on your knees and talking to the one who can might just be the way he uses you to be able to say, Nevada, be open.